Mm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've got a scientist actually today. I've got a historian, uh, an archaeologist. Uh, you've got a, a scientist, but a scientist who's been interested in the uh, history of the the Vikings, ever, ever since he found out that uh, his, the football team he supports uh, since the age of five has a, a, a Viking name. And uh, it's, it's Tranmere, who <laughs> for years I used to say that Tranmere is unique in being the only football team in the English league with a Norwegian Viking name. And that was okay until last year when they let me down very badly. <laughs> they got relegated out of the Football League uh, completely. Now we operate in the, uh, the National uh, Vanarama uh, com Conference. So, yeah, that's how I got uh, uh, interested in the, uh, the, the, the Vikings all those years ago. And of course now uh, research into the Vikings has become uh, uh, multi or inter disciplinary with many, uh, many subjects contributing. I mean, history and uh, archaeology are still the lead subjects, but science is now making an uh, important uh, contribution. This is about science and the Vikings, and also some speculation that the uh, Vikings may have had some scientific uh, skills than themselves. And of course, it's a great honour that uh, we follow, or I follow, uh, a string of very uh, distinguished uh, lecturers. The very first Harkon Harkonson lecturer uh, was uh, the great Magnus Magnusson, who gave this uh, seminar, Harkon, uh, the old Harkon who. Not only was he a very famous broadcaster for Mastermind, of course, but also series on, uh, on Vikings and Chronicle, but he was a distinguished uh, Viking scholar and translated, along with Palsen, uh, many of the uh, Icelandic sagas into, uh, into English. And uh, 15 years ago, he uh, wrote the foreword to a book that I wrote about the Vikings in the north west of England called Ingerman Saga. So I wrote to him, uh, his address was in the phone book, so very easy to find, asking if he would do this, expecting no reply. You know, these, these famous people, no time people like, uh, like us. And within two or three days, this uh, wonderful reply came back saying, Steve, I'd be delighted to write a foreword. What's more, if you send me the draft, I can maybe look through it and, and make some suggestions. I think he was just making sure that what he was putting his name to was, uh, uh, was, was okay, you know. And sure enough, I sent him the, the draft, and within uh, a few days, uh, this package came back. Uh, I opened the envelope, this waft of strong tobacco uh, came back. Apparently Magnus was a great pipe uh, smoker. And the, uh, the manuscript was full of green ink. He'd been right through it with a fine tooth comb. It cost him the whole weekend, this, uh, just uh, for me. And for the love of it, no charge, no fee, this was uh, uh, Magnus. Now, uh, this year, we updated this book uh, to take into account all the archaeology, all the DNA and everything that's been going on uh, in the Northwest over the last 15 years. And... Uh, it came out uh, last uh, week, uh, Ingerman Saga, uh, third edition. I contacted Sally, uh, Magnus's daughter, to say if this was, was okay, and it was, would, it be, would it be okay to include the old foreword from uh, Magnus, and also uh, would it be okay to write a, a, a short tribute uh, to him? And she was absolutely delighted. Uh, she said that uh, my dad would absolutely be thrilled if uh, you, uh, you, you, you did this. But what Magnus did do was to uh, dispel this uh, impression that uh, the public had that the Vikings were just uh, a bunch of adventurous, uh, violent, uh, aggressive people and there was nothing else uh, about them. Uh, far from the truth. Uh, he, more than any in the media, uh, was able to show 
just what an articulate uh, bunch of people uh, the the Vikings were. Sure, they were great uh, adventurers, they were great uh, navigators, explorers, they were great craftsmen. Uh, the skills in building these clinker boats, uh, seafaring boats, oceanfaring boats, was unparalleled. Uh, they were great lawyers. The word uh, law, law comes from uh, a Norse uh, uh, word, and there were great parliamentarians uh, with uh, the uh, assemblies or things. And uh, from the Wirral, where I'm from, we have a site called uh, Thingwall, where the, the Vikings had the uh, parliament. So he had this uh, uh, great ability to uh, convey uh, this uh, wonderful diversity spectrum of these attributes. Uh, for the Vikings. And uh, this, if you like, is that's the speculation that the uh, Vikings may also have been scientists to some degree. When they were navigating, they would have used the sun during the daytime. They would have used the stars at nighttime. They would have had someone who knew about the stars. A Patrick Moore, astronomer type, would perhaps be on board for the long journeys. And there's been some speculation recently that they were able to use these special uh, crystal sunstones. Sunstones are mentioned in the sagas. No one quite knows uh, what these were, but if they were uh, navigational aids, then uh, what uh, were they? And it so happens that uh, in Scandinavia, and in Iceland, there are these uh, very uh, special crystals uh, called uh, uh, calcite, calcium carbonate, also known as uh, uh, Icelandic uh, spar. And these are special properties. Uh, light uh, is a waveform, but it has uh, two, uh, two, what's called vectors, two degrees of polarization at right angles to each other. And if these two uh, vectors uh, interact with a medium in different ways, then you get two images when light uh, goes through. So this is my calcite crystal here, and you can see two images of the words optical calcite appearing. And the speculation that they might have used this because the intensity of the two images and the position depends on the, where the sunstone is in relation to the position of the sun in the sky and where you are uh, with, with respect to the geographic north. So could the Vikings have used this as some sort of aid to navigation in conditions uh, when the sun uh, wasn't uh, clear? Uh, for example, uh, when it's cloudy, uh, they may have been navigating around the British Isles, maybe around Scotland, I don't know where it's maybe been cloudy, uh, but could they uh, n navigate when it's cloudy if they couldn't see the, uh, the, the, the sun? So there's been a lot of speculation in the literature uh, about this. And I thought I'd just give you a little demonstration uh, with this overhead uh, projector. Okay, right, let's switch it on. Now, we've simulated a cloudy sky with the sort of uh, grey uh, background of the screen there. So there is an image of a square. You can all see that? Yep. If I put this on there, you need to train your eyes a bit, but you should be able to see two images of the square. Now, if I rotate this uh, crystal, then the, you can see one square moves around relative to the other. Okay, can you all see that? And also the intensity of the two squares changes relative to each other. And that position and the intensity depends on uh, where the observer with the crystal is in relation to the position of the sun in the sky and to the position of the person on the uh, Earth's globe. So if you calibrate this crystal 
under conditions of normal uh, daylight and you know where you are from certain landmarks and things, uh, you could in principle produce a dial which the uh, crystal could be fixed to, which would tell the observer where he or she uh, was. That's the theory. And then if you have thicker cloud, so I put that there, need to train you up, but you can just about see the image through the thick cloud. So this answers the question whether these things could be used under cloudy conditions. They, uh, they could be to a skilled uh, observer. Of course, this is all speculation until someone finds a, a Viking ship somewhere dug up in, in, from the ground with one of these in there. And that's yet to happen. So that's uh, just some nice scientific uh, speculation. But bearing in mind this crystal is found in abundance in Scandinavia, this might be the case. Okay, let's turn it off. So yes, we, we, we need to find uh, one of these in a uh, archaeological ship. That could be some years. So that's uh, some speculation about the scientific expertise of the, uh, the Vikings. For the rest of my talk, I'm going to be talking about how science is telling us about uh, the Vikings themselves. The Viking research is no longer the preserve of historians and archaeologists, but is multidisciplinary. From physics, and that was a piece of physics there, but in terms of the use of metal detectors, radar equipment and things, from chemical isotopes, and in terms of the DNA and genetics. In terms of isotopes, these are isotopes of oxygen, carbon, and strontium. They're stable isotopes. The numbers here refer to the numbers of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. They're not radioactive, they're not dangerous, they don't emit any radiation. But the ratios of these isotopes depends on where in the planet that materials containing oxygen, carbon, and strontium and also nitrogen are. So if we make an archaeological find, for example, there was a lady who was dug up at a place near Doncaster in Yorkshire, and she appeared to have been Viking in origin, but wanted confirmation of that. By examining the ratios of isotopes in the enamel or dentine, of the person, they could show that the isotope levels actually fitted somebody from Scandinavia or from the, the northeast of Scotland. So it was very likely this woman that was found came from uh, Scandinavia or spent part of her life in Scandinavia. And the same was done with these finds uh, over the last few years have been made in Oxford and, uh, and Weymouth of groups of uh, uh, the bodies of groups of uh, Viking uh, warriors and using this technology, uh, measuring the isotopes, uh, they could show that uh, these people came from different, all over Scandinavia, different parts of Scandinavia. And by measuring the protein or collagen in the bone for carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope of carbon, it decays to yield radioactivity, by measuring the radioactivity levels, they could date the persons being found. And with the, for example, the, those found in Weymouth in Dorset, they were able to show that the warriors there came from between the period of 930 to 1000 AD. That's as accurate as they could get, confirming that they were Viking Age people. And they've used this technology to date the Viking ships that have been found in Scandinavia. For example, those in Denmark, there's the Askakar ship in Gothenburg, and the wonderful ships at the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. Right, how many people have been to the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo? Me! <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Yeah, so you go in there, and this is the Osberg ship. There's another one on this side, which is the Gokstad ship. And took around the corner is the Tuna ship. But uh, just at the back here, uh, there are all these wonderful artefacts that were found. This, the Osberg ship was a burial ship. So on the ship was found the remains of two ladies and all these wonderful 
artifacts, wagons, caskets, sledges, beds, but you can't get anywhere near them now. They're so fragile, they've decayed away. All that's holding them together is the outside lacquer. These are under serious threat. The ships themselves are also under threat, but not under immediate threat. And that's because of the decay. Once you get the things out of blue clay, where they're preserved, they start to decay. So the Osberg ship, for example, was uh, excavated in 1904. And the first thing they had to do was to stop the wood from shrinking when it dried, because it would destroy all the intricate patterns that were found and all on, on, on the artifacts, all the wonderful carvings and things. So what they used was a material called uh, alum. Now at school, maybe you remember growing these copper sulfate and alum crystals, remember you used to grow a little crystal in this. So alum is a simple salt of potassium and aluminium sulfate that forms these crystals. And by injecting hot alum into these objects, when the alum cools, it forms crystals. And this gives the wood its strength. So when the wood dries, after being excavated, it doesn't shrink. It remains, retains its shape. And that's worked brilliantly over the last, well, up to the last 100 years, not recently. But what the conservators didn't realize was that over the years, alum reacted with the humidity in the Viking ship halls, catalyzed by the iron nails and rivets to give sulfuric acid. Now, sulfuric acid isn't, isn't good, okay? Because sulfuric, sulfuric acid, uh, over the years, has de degraded, decayed away all the wood fibre, all the cellulose, all the lignin, well, almost all of it has gone. So Norway's national treasure is under immediate threat. So these objects are at serious risk of crumbling away. Look okay on the outside, but on the inside, they're rotten. So last year was the first meeting of the Saving Osberg Research Group. And I'm proud to say I'm a member of this group. And although I work at Nottingham, the University of Oslo is planning on giving me a, what's called an adjunct professorship. That means 20% of my time is spent over in Oslo or working on this project. And the Saving Osberg laboratories have gone up just behind the ship museum. The Norwegian government's just given a grant of 50 million kroners, that's five million pounds, to try and get this right. This is, look at it, it's absolutely rotten. The white bits are what's left of the alum crystal. So if you look at this using a technique known as scanning electron microscopy, where we use high energy electrons which behave as waves, like light waves, so you can produce an image. And you can see this highly magnified wood fibre. You can see all these holes within the wood. All the cellulose and virtually all the lignin has gone. These large pieces here are the alum crystals. So we've got to replace the cellulose and lignin with what's called a consolidant. And it has to be a natural polymer. We can't just use plastic. They don't want a plastic boat or uh, plastic artifacts. That, that won't do. So it's got to be something which is uh, carbohydrate, uh, wood-like, which to replace the lost cellulose and uh, lignin. This is our task. This is the task of the research group. And amazingly, Norway may have its own natural resource to solve the problem. The Norwegian coastline, lots of coastline, lots of fjords, yes, and lots of these rascals, the crabs, okay? And the crabs on the shells have this remarkable polymer called uh, chitin, which gives the crab its rigid, firm structure, appearance, stops it from falling apart, and also keeps it dry. It stops the inside of the crab from evaporating away. It stops also seawater from getting in. Now the chitin, this material, can be modified to give this marvelous polymer called uh, chitazan. So chitazan, this is like the cellulose, but it's got these special groups on it, which can be used to reduce the acid in the wood and also take out the metal ions, which are causing 
all the problem. Jenny is one of three PhD students working on the project. Jenny's with me in Nottingham, but there's Emily in Norway, another student working in Italy on the problem. And this is a, a picture of the catazine molecule magnified a million times. I sound like Brian Cox now, aren't I? A million, a million times. And it's a rigid type of polymer, which if we can get it inside the wood, will give the wood its strength back. And it's very like the original cellulose in its properties. And we can further modify the cardizan by various chemical reactions to make it longer lasting. The problem then is to try and get it into the wood to give the wood its strength back. That's our task over the next two or three years to get this sorted. If we fail, the consequences are disastrous, okay? So uh, we, uh, we have to get right. And fortunately, there's lots of test wood that was discovered with the ships, which we can try these theories out. So let's hope that these things will remain. And then when we visit the ship museum again, it's not just all blank spaces at the back of the museum. That wouldn't do, would it? No. So that's sort of chemistry in action. Now, back to physics, and this is very popular. These metal detectors can set you back 300 pounds to 1,000 pounds, depending on how sophisticated they are. And amateur enthusiasts are absolutely fantastic with this type of simple physical equipment. They found thousands of objects, many from the Viking age with this. And basically what it is, is you have an oscillating electrical current, which sets up an alternating magnetic field. And then if you've got any metal objects underneath the ground, which you can't see, that magnetic field sets up its own electrical current in the metal, which we call an eddy current, which produces its own magnetic field, which interferes with the original magnetic field and is picked up by the detector, either as a light blip or a, a sound blip or whatever. So if it's something metal that's underneath the ground to a reasonable depth, then uh, this will uh, pick it up. Uh, now in the past, it's been quite difficult to police because people have been going out, finding things, and they've been frightened about uh, giving them up in case uh, it's confiscated or the, uh, the crown take the right of the material and there's no record. That's changed now. Uh, there's regulations set up in Scotland and England and Wales which protects the enthusiast for a find. And a recent spectacular find is by this man here, Derek McLennan. This is the, the Galloway find, which was made in 2014. I think we still don't know where it was. They've tried to sort of conceal where the site has been to stop everyone coming over there and trying, just in case that, uh, they wanted to properly assess the ground where it was found to see if anything else was down there which was of value. And McLennan, working with a group of people, uh, initially found a collection of ingots and these are uh, arm braces and they found this wonderful silver cross, this bird. And then underneath the original found, they found this Carolingian silver pot, which is the largest that's been found uh, anywhere. And that contained also valuable treasure. <laughs> a lot of it was Anglo-Saxon, so possibly the material derived from a monastery <laughs> or somewhere originally. But nonetheless, this is a fantastic find. And these are particularly impressive, these armbands with these runic inscriptions are on. This cross gives the game away, really, that it did come from a monastery. And in Scotland, we have the treasure trove law, which protects the finder. And that means with this law, then the finder is more likely to come forward and reveal his or her treasure to the <coughs> museums and uh, finds officers there. We have a similar scheme in England and Wales <coughs> called the PAS, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, and it works brilliantly. I think McLennan stands to make a small fortune, in half a million pounds, which was the sort of market value of the finds. I think it's yet to be decided where the treasure is going to be displayed, whether it goes back to Dumfriesia or whether it goes to the National Museum of Scotland. A recent find in England, not far from where I live, I live in the East Midlands, near a place called Thurkeston. This 
grey shading corresponds to high densities of Scandinavian place names. This is part of the old Dane law, separated by this dotted line here, which follows approximately Watling Street, the A5. Last year, there was a hoard of coins and other treasure found at Ferguson, again, by a metal detector enthusiast, and that was correctly uh, recorded and everything else. And also, this remarkable Thor's amulet was discovered. From my area, uh, Wirral, Tramere is here somewhere, by the way. Wirral is also steeped in Scandinavian place names. This is a thing wall. And many things have been found here, including this coin, which we all got excited about. Uh, again, a metal detector enthusiast found this. And this is a coin which was attributed to Olaf Guthfrisson, who was the Viking king coming from Dublin, who fought in the Battle of Brunanburg, this huge battle which the Vikings and Scots fought together, not against each other like in logs, fought together against the common enemy from Angleland, the English, in 937. And most scholars have placed this battle in Wirral because the old name for Bromborough is Brunanborough. So, gosh, was, this coin was found. And it was passed as genuine by the numismatics experts at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And by which time I'd use this in one of my books on Viking DNA. My colleague, David Griffiths, who's an archaeologist at Oxford, had used it in his book on the Vikings of the Irish Sea. And then another coin like it appeared in eBay. <laughs> so suspicions were arisen. And the coin was checked for its metal contact by, there's a group at Harwell in Oxfordshire, uh, do this called a technique known as electron probe microwave analysis, where you fire high energy electrons at the, the metal, and then you measure the spectrum of X-rays which are given off. And the spectrum depends on the, the various metals that are present. Now, that analysis, which costs about 50p to do, uh, showed that this coin was sterling silver. That's uh, mostly silver with a bit of copper. Now, it can't be anything older than, it's a fake, than the 19th century. Because if it had been from the Viking Age, we'd had lots of impurities like lead, bismuth, all this sort of stuff. It was a fake, but a very brilliant fake. I mean, some guy must have taken ages to produce this sort of stuff. Uh, but we were uh, fooled, and uh, David and myself, all we could do was have a, a, a chuckle about it. So this is a matter of course now. These finds should be checked to see if they are genuine. The analysis is quite simple, and well, not simple, but it's, it's, it's quite uh, cheap to do by the experts. Right, take a pub. This is the railway in, in Mells, again in Wirral. Mells is an old Viking name meaning sand hills, and it's one of the seaports the Vikings used to use in the Irish Sea in the 9th and 10th centuries. Take a pub and take a group of chaps, right? Take a policeman and uh, Tim Baldock. Now what happened was that they were planning on doing some extensions to the outside of the, the pub, uh, building a patio or something. So, and somebody went through the local archaeological office and there was a record something buried underneath the, the car park. And it turned out that it was something which this man here, John McRae Jr., or his dad, had discovered back in the 1930s. In the 1930s, the former pub building was near the road and decided to knock it down, make a car park, and build a new pub behind. Under the foundations, they found what was an old clinker-built, like the Vikings, clinker-built wooden ship, or part of it. And the foreman told the workers, put the clay back straight away. We don't want archaeologists and people messing about here and holding things back. That's what happened. It was all forgotten about until John McRae wrote or sketched what he saw and then passed it to his son, John McRae Jr. And it was then passed on to the museums. This is 26 years ago and just left there. Anyway, it all came to light in 2007 when there was a patio application put in and the local history sleuth Tim Baldock, Peace Tim Baldock, got in touch with me. He said, Steve, do you know anything about some, some ship or some possible Viking ship? And the report said, no, didn't know. 
So I rang up Liverpool Museum. I got made contact with Rob Philpott, who is well, was the uh, curator there, and he did some searching and found out the plans for this uh, the sketch. And so the next thing we did was to see if it was still down there. And it's always good having a police contact because we got the police's leading ground penetrating radar man. And so as a team, we got together. It looks like a, a Bex Bissell <coughs> carpet shampoo thing, but it's, it's a bit like a metal detector, but it works on a different principle in the sense that uh, you fire electromagnetic radiation, you know, microwaves or whatever, through the ground, and then you measure the intensity and time required for the signal to get back, and then just scan the ground. So we have to move all the tables and dustbins and things and scan right across the area. So the time it takes to get from where the object is and back again depends on the, the depth, and the intensity depends on the quality or type of material underneath. So you calibrate this instrument with no materials, metal objects, other things, wood as well. And that means you can profile what's underneath the ground. And uh, this is what we got. So you can see the outline of what looks like a ship-like artifact underneath. Now it must be very, very old because it's a distance away from where the seafront is. This is not a Victorian fake. This is a genuine old vessel, which is still down there, but we don't know how old it is. It would cost six million pounds to excavate. The local council will not be giving us that money, and neither will English Heritage. But what we can do is go down and sample a piece of wood, get it carbon dated, and confirm what the date is. Now, we were originally hoping it would be before 1066, which is the end of the, the Viking Age, what we thought. In England, we're so pleased about the Battle of Logs because the end of the Viking Age now is 1263. Is that right? <laughs> so anything older than 1263 would be absolutely marvellous. So that's the next job, and uh, we're currently uh, sorting out a team to, uh, uh, to do this. With our contacts at the uh, Ship Museum in Oslo. Uh, I'm sure we can get the thing uh, uh, dated uh, very competently. Right, take another group of chaps. This is down the road at uh, Neston, not far from where that fake coin was found. And in the church of St Mary and St Helen in Neston, which again is a Viking name, are all these marvellous cross fragments that have been smashed up either during the Reformation or during Cromwell, we don't know. So there's at least two or three crosses there in pieces. This one's interesting because it's got the image of part of a Viking woman. Here's a ponytail here, here's a, a dress, with her arm round what we presume is her husband here, but the rest of it's missing. Now, with a grant from English Heritage, I'm working in conjunction with Merseyside Conservation Centre. This is Roger White, who's an archaeologist from Birmingham, who originally did work on the stones 20 years ago. This is Martin Cooper, who runs the Conservation Centre in Liverpool. This is Neil Robb, and this is the church manager, Peter Rossiter. So we all got together, and the Conservation Centre scanned the fragments using a technique known as a laser triangulation. And what you do is you fire a strip of laser light at the object and then you record the intensity, scattered intensity of light on a CCD detector focused by this lens system. So you can map accurately the surface of the object. Actually, this is what they're doing with the objects in Norway now, just in case it goes wrong, you know, with the conservation there. They're scanning all the objects so they could re recreate these objects if we do make a mess of it. So, accurate scanning and then reproducing the cross, uh, filling in the missing bit because this lady also appears uh, in uh, in Scandinavia, in, uh, in Gotland, uh, on the Tang Beda stone. Uh, the gentleman appears on the cross at Middleton in North 
Yorkshire. So we could piece them together again. And then working with local schools, because these would have been painted in the Viking Age, that they would have been, we're not sure what colours, but this is the lady's hair restored. Now, the youngsters originally painted the man's hat as red. So someone pointed out it looked like, a bit like Noddy. So that was a uh, change. And also, this was a hat. So we had to restore the lady's uh, hair again. But it's fantastic. And it's on display in the church. Right, so that's chemistry, physics, laser technologies. Uh, I'll just finish off with a bit about uh, DNA and uh, ancestry. We've been involved with two projects. This followed on from the Blood of Vikings, which we were involved with at Nottingham. But then there was a follow-up in 2003, working with scientists at the University of Leicester. Leicester is the birthplace of forensic genetics. Did anyone see that documentary last year about Sir Alec Jeffrey and the tracking down of that murderer using DNA fingerprint technology. So working with them, uh, what we wanted to do was to accurately map uh, the coastal regions up the northwest, starting with Wirral and West Lancashire uh, for part one, and then uh, part two uh, going into North Lancashire, Cumbria and North Yorkshire, and then maybe part three coming into this interesting area here, which is Dumfriesia, south of Scotland. This was complete 2008. There's a reason why this has taken such a long time, which will become <laughs> apparent in a minute. These are colleagues from Leicester, Professor Mark Jobling and Dr Turi King. This was taken in 2010 when we were doing some sampling in Norway. Now, Turi has become very famous because she's the scientist who did the... DNA work on Richard III. You know, the, another, car, another car park. This is a, a, a supermarket car park. We found that bloke under the car park. So Turing was the scientist who did the DNA work on Richard III. You don't recognise this statue here. It's a picture taken in Haugesund in Norway. It's a very attractive-looking statue, don't you think? Yeah? Some folks think it's the mermaid, but that's, uh, of course, in, in Copenhagen. It's uh, Marilyn Monroe. People don't realise that Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn's real name was Marilyn Mortensen, and Marilyn's father came from Haugesund in the west coast of Norway. Now, if we're probing genetics, there's a very direct way. We can just look at the manifestations of genetics, looking at Vikings. Maybe we could go for the characteristics that people associate Vikings with, that sort of blonde hair and blue eyes, as manifested by this young man here, who is Stefan Edberg, yeah, Stefan. Yeah, you can't get more Scandinavian than him. And it's true, the genes, there's more than one gene, the genes responsible for fur hair and blue eyes seem to derive from the, the Baltic Sea. For example, Gotland, in the middle of it all, there's things like 95% of the people there have fur hair and blue eyes, something very, very uh, high indeed. But the problem is we don't know if they came here from the Vikings or some other time. Uh, it could have been, uh, you know, a thousand years before. We don't know. Uh, another condition which appears to come from the Vikings is this uh, contracture called a Dupuytren's uh, contracture. And you get this when you get to uh, your 50s or 60s where you can't extend your fourth or fifth uh, finger. It's a tightening of elastic, elastic tissue. Anyone that got this here? My wife's got this condition which perhaps <laughs> explains things. So she can't extend these fingers. Margaret Thatcher had this condition as well, which again uh, explains one or two uh, things uh, uh, perhaps. It's, it's a condition which is very, which is common in Scandinavia and places that were settled by the Vikings. And in Indeed, we know more about the genetics of this now. We, revise, we, we think we've, we know the chromosome, chromosome 16, where the uh, condition for this contracture is. You can get it, uh, you can get elastic tissue uh, treated. It's a simple uh, surgical operation to uh, relieve uh, this, uh, th th this condition. Or we can analyse people's DNA directly. This is the famous double helical structure which everyone knows about 
So they all know about Watson and Crick. What people don't know about is the discovery of the bonds which hold the DNA molecule together. That was discovered by a young PhD student at the University of Nottingham, a chap called Michael Creeth. And Mike Creeth was my supervisor as a research fellow when I was down at Bristol. And next year is the 70th anniversary of the discovery of hydrogen bonds in DNA. So having a big meeting at Nottingham to celebrate this. So DNA basically tells us what we are, but we can also use it as a probe into our ancestry. The test is very simple. I think a lot's been said about this. Has anyone actually done the DNA test, the mouth swab? Two people there, yeah. Do you do it as a, as a research project or do it through uh, British Ancestry or Family Tree or some of like that, National Geographic? Yeah. You get supplied this little mouth swab. When this came out about 15 years ago, people, men would refuse to do it because they thought it was uh, uh, going to go to the police or you'd be cloned or something. But now it's... Uh, it's very popular and you can get individual testing now for something like 100 pounds and you get these little sheets back saying where your <coughs> ancestors come from or something. And it's very simple, you just put this little uh, brush in your mouth, you rub against your, uh, your cheeks. Uh, you don't brush your teeth, otherwise we trace you back to a bacteria, not to a, uh, a, a viking or whatever. And then you put the brush into a tube containing something like washing up liquid, it's called a, a SDS, which is a preservative, and you twizzle it about. You throw away the, the brush, like you do with any, any toothbrush, and then it goes back to the uh, laboratory uh, for testing and analysis. And there's a Turi, again, and Pila at Leicester. And then it's analysed using equipment like this, which is called a PCR machine, and then you get these DNA fingerprints, which can help us to type your chromosomes or chromosome types. So from these fingerprints here, is Mr. Hyde the same as Dr. Jekyll? And the answer is no. They have different fingerprints. This is not real data, by the way. There's no uh, Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde. So we can analyse these messages from our, our ancestors, or we can analyse parts of our DNA which we get from our mums down the maternal line, or we can analyse what's called Y chromosomal DNA, which comes from our fathers only if you're men. This DNA is all mixed up, we get it all mixed up from our mums and dads. This DNA is passed along the maternal line with no change, this along the paternal line from no change. So we can analyse our paternal line or our maternal line. If we're blokes, if we're women, we can only analyse our maternal line. So take the Hardings, that's our lot. This is my wife, Anne, and these are my four sons, Tom, Rich, Matt and John. So they will have the same Y chromosome as me. Or at least I hope so. <laughs> and uh, then this is our wonderful granddaughter, Annabelle. She's now five. So John presented us with a granddaughter five years ago. And this is Simone, who's Annabelle's mum. So Annabelle will not have the Y chromosome from me because she's a girl. And she won't have the mitochondrial DNA from Anne because she will get that from her own mum, which is Simone, who comes from Dresden and East Germany. That's how it operates. But the nice thing about the, the Y chromosome is we can link it also to surnames, which are also passed along the male line with little or no change. With these projects, what we've done is it's focused on men because only men pass on their surnames with no change. That's why we've, so sorry ladies, that's why we focus on men. There's no discrimination, but you should let us off that. The Y DNA, by, by the way, doesn't code for anything. It's got what's called junk DNA on it, which, uh, again, women think is very appropriate for the male chromosome. But it has this wonderful signal from our past. So by choosing volunteers from men who have surnames that are in these areas prior to 1600, we could get round the huge problem of population movement into and out of the areas after the Industrial Revolution. This is especially important in the Northwest, especially around Liverpool, because of the huge growth of Liverpool as a port in the 18th century. So by using men 
with surnames that were exclusive or, or were in the area prior to 1600, then we could make the test rigorous. And this is the sort of result you get. This looks very beautiful, but perhaps uh, meaningless. But what we're showing here is distributions of the various male Y chromosome types or haplogroups in the particular areas. So, for example, in Norway, there's lots of this group here called R1A1, but hardly any in Ireland or in central Scotland, whereas in Orkneys and Shetlands it's something sort of halfway between the two. In the northwest of England, again you've got some signal Isle of Man and Lake District. In modern Wirral and West Lancashire, taken for the modern population with no surname criteria, you get small levels of this, but in a medieval population that means people who have surnames that were present in these areas prior to 1700, then you get quite a spectacular result. Now that we can compare the whole distributions with each other to work out the extent of ancestry or how similar populations are to each other, or we can focus on particular markers. For example, R1A1. In Norway, 35% of the men have this type and very few have this in Wales, Anglesey, and in central Scotland and in Ireland. And even in places like Holland and York, levels are very low. And Denmark is quite low, so quite distinct from the Norwegian. This is quite a good marker for Norse or Norwegian Vikings. You can see that in medieval West Lancashire and Wirral, there's quite a substantial, almost half the amount in Norway. This work was published in 2008, at the end of part one. You see the, the football team of authors present. This shows you how multidisciplinary this sort of research is now. We've got mixtures of scientists, geneticists, Viking experts, Judith Jesh is professor of Viking studies at Nottingham, Patrick Waite, is chairman of the West Lanx Heritage Association. Stephen Roberts is an expert on surnames, a whole group of people coming together. This is published in 2010 in this book form. This is the book with the error, with that fake, fake coin in, by the way. So it's a collector's <laughs> item. So part two should have been finished by now. And the reason for that, uh, why it hasn't been finished, is because of him. And he is... Yeah, he's got a lot to answer for, this man. <laughs> OK. And, of course, Leicester made a fortune out of Richard III. But this man has delayed the, uh, the Viking project. This is different from other Viking projects because it's focused on surnames. It's very specific. It gets behind the movements of populations over the last few hundred years. So quite different from the other ancestral studies that have been untake and undertaken in the uh, British uh, Isles. And just to finish off, this is the epilogue, which brings us back to Magnus Magnusson again. Remember, I showed you that picture of the uh, statue from uh, Haugesund in Norway. And I mentioned there was uh, uh, people, we were working, getting control data from Norway to compare our samples from the northwest. One of the guys helping us recruit volunteers from Norway was this enthusiast here, Sigurd Orsa, who's very prominent in the historical societies there, but he's a, a billionaire. He's a, one of these Richard Branson types. Don't, don't these guys look the same, don't they? These, uh, these millionaires look a similar sort of appearance. And he's got tons of money. And he paid Decode in Iceland a few years ago to do a whole DNA test. He paid a £4,000 for the test and the result came back saying things like he had a 70% chance of having blonde hair. Okay, now look in a mirror. <laughs> That's of course £4,000. But he is an enthusiast. And we were sitting, after we've been doing the testings, we were sitting in a restaurant in Hargesund, which he owned. We stayed at a hotel which he built near the Marilyn Monroe statue, which he 
commissioned. And then he said, uh, actually, we, we're building this, uh, this Viking ship. Oh, really? When this thing is built, how about bringing it down to the northwest? Because we've got lots of uh, England, lots of heritage there. Why don't you, you know, bring it down to us uh, when it's finished? He said, yeah, sure. And so uh, this came out. And uh, there was also some folks from Largs uh, that caught wind of this. So the plan was that when this vessel was complete, it would come over the top of Scotland, Orkney, Shetlands, come <laughs> down uh, towards the Irish Sea, stop at Largs, and then come to, uh, to Merseyside, to uh, uh, Wallasey Pool, uh, where folks could have a chance to, to row this vessel. So we all, as part of the preparation, trained this uh, navy of volunteers working with local boat clubs like Liverpool Victoria Boat Club and uh, also some folks in, uh, uh, in East Midlands with Loughborough Boat Club. Very enthusiastic. To take part in this, you had to do this course or be, or be a proven oarsman to be able to row this uh, vessel. Anyway, it was uh, launched in 2012. It's appeared on a postage stamp in Norway. It's huge. It's 35 metres. It's almost half the length of a football pitch. It requires, when rowed, 100 oarsmen, 50 men on each side, two men, two, or women, to an oar. Now, the plan was for this to come down in 2013, but unfortunately we're delays and things and they were very apologetic so we got this email from Sigurd saying well, why don't you come over to Norway and row it along the coastline here we can't bring it across to England and Scotland yet but we can you can come over here and row it so he paid for us to go across he paid for the hostel accommodation for us to uh, uh, stay out we brought this this group across and we had a great time weather was uh, fantastic it was like a mill pond like here in logs and uh, so we spent two or three days rowing this marvellous ship. And you can see it's a bit ragged. This is actually Giles Christian who came with us. Giles Christian is a quite a famous author of Viking novels, Odin's Raven and Blood Eye and things. You might have read these. Look how ragged it is. Now when we tried rowing this thing, the distance between the oars is based on the Osberg and, uh, and Gokstad ships. So we were bumping into each other. It was, it was just a mess. Um, and then if we took three quarter strokes, it was fine. So we didn't take the full, the full stroke, but to take three quarter strokes, we got some rhythm. We actually got a good speed with this thing. So why? Why were we rowing like this? So two reasons, two possible reasons. Either the style of rowing was different in the Viking Age, or... Or, what's the, or they were smaller. That's right. These guys were were shorter. That can be the only uh, explanation uh, of that. Nowadays, we are on average uh, much uh, taller people. So we can even have a as yours truly here. It's possible to row it very slowly. Look at this lazy lot here taking pictures. What a, a rotten, uh, a rotten lot. So you could row it singly, but uh, yeah, great fun. And then they tried to bring it over to the UK in 2014, but disaster struck because the the mast broke off when it was offshore of the Shetlands. And luckily it didn't kill anybody, it just fell straight into the sea. Now rather than go back, they decided to bring it down the Caledonian Canal, powered by an authentic Viking motor, <laughs> just on, on board for health and safety. We would rather actually have gone back because it, it came into Merseyside, it bypassed logs, it came into Merseyside, crippled. And... Uh, we had it for two weeks, it's supposed to be for dis display and roaming and things, but instead it was just being repaired by Camel Road Shipyard. So a new mast was uh, obtained uh, from Dumfriesia. It was a Douglas fir tree and it was built as solid as a rock. So now uh, it's fine and it reached uh, America, I think in July. Low disaster there struck because it was supposed to go to the Tall Ships Festival in Chicago, but they found they had to pay uh, £50,000 for the rights to go through the waterways and things, so uh, 
uh, they, 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 they decided to sail back in, instead. So fingers crossed, hopefully it will come uh, back to Britain next year and maybe come to Largs. Uh, we've got to find the guy who was, uh, we were communicating with. Someone said it was someone called uh, Harry. Uh, so that would be nice to bring for next year's uh, Viking Festival, perhaps, or, and also bring it to, uh, to Merseyside. This is where there's a nice end to the talk, because Carmoy in Norway, the Isle of Alvarsnes, is where we were doing the, the rowing as part of the Viking Festival there. But it's also the site of St. Olaf's Church, and this is a very famous church, and it's been built on the site of an old uh, uh, pagan site for worship. And the stones here, which once belonged to the pagan site of... Anyone been to this? Anyone been to the Carmoy Viking Festival? Yes, so you've probably seen this. It's, it's really atmospheric, isn't it? But hark on the old hark and who by Magnus Magnusson, the first Harkin Harkinson lecture, was commissioned by the very Harkin the Fourth of Norway. Harkin the Old, Harkin uh, Harkinson. So it's quite nice having done this and uh, learned, I didn't know this until I read this uh, splendid book, that this was the site of his church. So not only is he famous for the, uh, the Battle of, uh, uh, of Largs, but uh, also other things as, uh, as well. Thank you for your attention. It's been a great honour. <laughs>